Welcome back to the Keep Going Podcast with Vin Kennedy. I'm your host, Vin Kennedy. Today we have a special guest. This is Sarah. Sarah, you want to do a brief intro on yourself? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Sarah Grippy Snyder. I am a certified mental performance consultant from the Association of Applied Sports Psychology. I also have a certification in um, NASM, which is a performance enhancement specialist. And along that degree, I also got to like focus on sport and macronutrition. Um, but while I, I'm practicing all that, I'm also a hybrid athlete that focuses on like OCR, DECA. I haven't done the high rocks yet, but I'm definitely interested. I uh, really love trail running and all these functional fitness events. I'm really excited to uh, try what, you know, the new stuff that is coming upon us these couple like next years. No, that's, that's awesome. And yeah, obviously we're very aligned when it comes to the athletic feats. Um, and I definitely want to just kind of like touch on the coaching. Like we kind of just briefly talked about earlier. Um, I think it's cool that it's not just like, you know, straight up fitness trainer coaching. Like you, you implement a lot of different things. So if you kind of want to go into how you handle that and how you handle um, all the different avenues with your clients. Yeah. So like basically my practice is centered around a holistic approach. And basically what that means is I have, I look at the client as a whole and as a whole person in every aspect of life compared to just their athletic performance. A lot of people do come to me just wanting to fix one specific problem. And most of the time it's way deeper than that. So I really like to find out what the root cause is in the athlete's personal life. And, um, when I mean by personal life too, these people's lives, um, my clientele ranges from like age six to the retired community. So when it comes to their personal life, everybody's going through a different stage. And sometimes you get that massive roadblock in the way that you, you're not a hundred percent sure how to get through that. So basically my job is to show you your inner edge and basically show your full potential. And the way I do that is basically build a rapport and try to open up um, somebody with every aspect of their life. And then from there, we really try to assess the situation better um, from it. And um, also, I know that I keep talking about how I just work with athletes and um, I work with more than just athletics. Uh, I can work with people in the medical professional if somebody's in performance, performance arts, uh, tactical business. And if you're just trying to uh, do better in exercise or recreational sports, that all falls in the same spectrum. I think sometimes there's a stigma with the word, you know, sports psychology, and it doesn't have to just be in that specific realm. Um, but yeah, what I like to work with, with my clients, we work on the mental piece, but we also touch base on their training. So like, since I have a certification in personal training, somebody can come to me and tell me like, what they're doing on a regular basis. And of course there's probably some mental block from there. So I do two and two together where we work on that mental block, but then we also can fudge with their training program as well. So like, let's say they just really want to get better upper body strength and they're having pain in their arm. I'm able to pinpoint kind of those areas of what exercises and rehab tools that would be beneficial for them. But also, like I said, add that mental aspect aspect in there as well, because if they don't have the confidence to even try something like that, we can't get stronger, you know, like, so it's a whole spectrum when it comes to it. And of course, nutrition as well, if you're not um, eating the proper things, your body is not going to perform well, your mind is probably going to get in its own, you know, crummy way however you want to explain it so bringing all of those aspects of, together of making sure the person is eating correctly for their body type their training is good for their uh, sport that they're trying to be better in. and of course step one is always their mind so I, I like to do those three pillars and that's kind of where like the three gx came from in the first place I really like that yeah it is it's really cool and I I often say it and it's like the body follows the mind, right? Like what you think is possible is what exactly what you'll do. And that's the result you'll get. And if you have a mental block, like you're saying, um, you know, that's where you're, you're going to stop yourself. So what is like a, a constant slump that you kind of see people falling into? Or is there a theme going around that? Like when you're, when a client comes to you, there is like a, almost something that at this point you could pinpoint from dealing with you know multiple people that, uh, that really hinders people. Oh, there, 
anytime that I think everybody has the same problem, it's, it's not true at all. You could possibly use the same theory to get kind of the same uh, result at the end. But yeah, pinpointing one exact thing, it's so challenging to be able to do that. I do have one specific one, but I wanna to touch base on some of the reasons why people go through slums. And um, number one, um, I feel like it's just negative self-talk. I think that's a very easy one that everybody uh, gets uh, in their head accidentally just more negative than seeing what's the good, but other areas are like adversity. Um, some athletes have like burnout and possibly overtraining, um, just having that lack of excitement in the first place and what you're doing. Uh, we, you already touched base on those roadblocks and just like lack of feeling in control. But with that negative self-talk, um, you kind of talked about how to prevent those certain things. And I kind of wanted to show you um, a way that I work with my clients because sometimes the communication just through verbal talk isn't always enough. You have to have that take home message. So one of the messages I show people, it's like, okay, if you have negative self-talk, um, I call this the bully um, bottle. And basically what we do is like, okay, what are some of the things that you say negatively to yourself? And uh, I'm just going to pretend you're like my client right now. What is something negative that you told yourself before a competition? I guess like if we're going to get into like, uh, I do a lot of marathons So just say like, oh, that, that time is fast. You know, the pace that I have to keep is very fast. Like, I don't know if I'm fast enough to keep that pace. Okay. I'm not fast enough to keep that pace. Something else you might tell yourself. Um, I guess like a, like one of those things where, uh, imposter syndrome just kind of comes in. So same, same basic idea thing. Um, I get, you get, you kind of just get in your head where it's like, I don't know if I could do this. So that yeah. would be another so, one. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not good enough for this. You know, we can keep the list going on. I suck. I shouldn't be here. I don't look like everybody else. We see that this bottle is starting to get nice and crumpled. Now, let's try to start saying some positive words to yourself. I am strong. I am deserving. I, I want to be able to do all the things that I know that I can do. So we're basically pumping ourselves up. So I'm going to blow the bottle back up. See how it's retained back into a shape, but you can see all of these little crinkles and cracks that keep in that, bot, uh, in that bottle. Basically the same thing is happening to us. The more that we talk negative about ourselves, the more that we're shaping ourselves into that actual thing that we keep telling ourselves. And even when we start talking positive, yeah, we can fix some of it, but we are still putting ourselves in that realm of I'm, I'm not able to be this person that I keep trying to be. So in the beginning of trying to prevent that negative self-talk, we have to first, you know, be aware of how, uh, wh how we got into that slump in the first place. And um, from there, like, how are those negative words impacting you? And if you feel like you are an imposter, then you feel like you're never going to be a marathon runner. And if you feel like you don't look like everybody else, you're going to instantly talk about yourself bad before even starting. So right when you go into anything with those negative words, you've already gave yourself your outcome. That is exactly how you're going to perform because you didn't tell yourself that you could do it in the first place. Um, so those type of phrases that keep ourselves in that positive mode, meaning, um, meaning like I am strong, I am deserving, I am the fastest athlete in the world. It's hard for us to believe it sometimes because we have such that rewiring or re like training in our minds that we can't do it. So the more that we start practicing this, of course, the more that we're going to be able to believe it. And um, the brain itself, of course, it's a muscle like everything else. And we know if we're not training an area of our body, it's going to get weaker. It takes about 72 hours for that gain to uh, completely go away. And the same thing is for our brain. Our brains are the biggest muscle in our body, but yet we don't train it like we do anything else. So the more that we tell ourselves that we aren't deserving, the more the brain's going to be like, okay, like that's who you are. 
the more that we tell ourselves positive things, eventually we're not even going to have to tell ourselves positive things because it turns into a lifestyle. And I think that's what people really um, don't see the difference. They think it's just going to be these quick tips and tricks. And yes, um, basically what I'm showing you right now is a quick tip, but we have to figure out the deeper meaning than that. Like, why do you say those certain things to yourself? Why can you not get over that hump? And that's when the uh, talk therapy sessions really come into play because we have to figure out the deeper meaning before I can just give you, you know, an example like that. So, so true because, and, and something as you're speaking there, like really, really hits to me is, have you ever heard of the, um, the analogy of like a thermostat? Like the thermostat is set in the room it doesn't matter how much work you put in. If you have this self-limiting belief, that's where you're going to stay. If the thermostat set at 69 degrees, you want to get you want to get up to 70. If you lock yourself mentally at 69, you're never going to surpass that. Um, yeah, it's it's so true, and it, it really is. It's it's all in your head, right? Like you live up to the the standard that you set for yourself in your mind. Um, and now hearing you say that, I buy in fully. But I know, obviously, there's people out there that love to kind of play devil's advocate or play the negative side of the fence to even begin with. And what are kind of, so I do like, I am affirmations. I do all that stuff myself. I have a dream board. So I'm, I'm big in this, this world and I'm totally aligned with you. But what are the, some, some of the things you say to clients that come to you and maybe don't fully buy in? Sorry. When they don't buy in. Um, or if they, if they the kind of have like some kickback to the, like those like saying I am worthy, like they really just can't gotcha. believe it yet themselves. So a tool that I can use from there, it's either called, um, you can do motivational interviewing or also performance profiling. And it's basically whenever, like you said, the client kind of disagrees with, oh, this is going to be possible. And um, basically what I'm telling them that they are deserving, they are you know exactly where they need to be like yes it's very hard to sometimes believe that especially from somebody that you might not know completely so when it comes to motivational interviewing it's still a collaborative approach where you're working together but you kind of let the client guide you on where they want to be so you kind of see where their ups and downs are um, try to understand them more as a um, as an athlete and a person but then that's when they kind of come to their own conclusions of hmm, maybe I am talking a little bit more negative and this switch from negative to positive talking isn't as silly as it sounds. And that's one of the things that, like you said, that buy-in, it's very, very hard to get anybody that if they don't see the benefit in the beginning, uh, they're not working with me. If I go over and be like, hey, I saw you fumble during your race, I have something for you. They instantly put that guard up that wall and they don't wanna talk about their emotions. They don't want me to be, they don't want people to see that. And if, if people see that, they basically get defensive. So the way that is the best way um, to get that buy-in whenever I don't have specifically the client coming to see me in the first place is just doing the stuff myself. You know, like most of the time when I go to these events, um, I feel like I'm around a lot of like-minded people. Do they know exactly how to get there? Not really. And that's why I went into this education because whenever I was a college athlete, I also didn't know how to get there. Now I know the certain things that really can help me. And whenever I do get in those slumps, because even though I practice this daily and I work with people, doesn't mean that I always practice it myself. But when I do, I notice a world of a difference. And when people see that I'm actually able to do it, it's like, cool, I want to be able to do what she's able to do. And the buy-in seems to be a little bit more uh, promising after that because I like to do what I like I like to show what I preach and if I'm not doing it myself like how is anybody going to believe me that this is actually beneficial um, and that's another thing I kind of wanted to talk about we were talking about how um, I got into this job in the first place in, in the beginning of my career, I always told myself that I was a dumb athlete and I wasn't smart and I don't deserve these certain things. I went to a, a high school that all my friends like were really trying to be doctors and they were going to Ivy League schools and they, they were supposed to make the big bucks. And I didn't really have much of a direction other than I knew I wanted to play uh, basketball in college. And then after that, I learned so much about myself and geez, first off, college basketball is a completely different mind game itself. Like I realized that if 
I did not do the work, I was not going to survive in that environment. And it's, it's funny, I played at a D3 school and recruits, they, you have, have like 20 people in your class. And then by the time your senior year hits, there's like maybe two of us at the end. And that really shows the difference between somebody that thinks like, oh, I was the best in high school. And then they go to college and they're not anymore. Like, how do you get over those humps? But anyways, after I figured out that, you know, I'm the reason why I keep putting myself in this identity, I need to get over this my own slump of feeling like I don't deserve this. So a lot of practice came with that. And I feel like throughout this whole entire journey of learning who I am with the professional life, with also my athletic life and my personal life, I feel like I've truly made a full lifestyle change that, you know, it's, it's everything that I breathe, sleep and eat, you know, it, it's just, I've learned that overtaking those feelings was easier than running away from them. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I align with so much of what you're saying. And I, I, it's funny, I just had a conversation with my massage therapist. She's the best, but she, we were talking about like bravery and like courage. And she always kind of says like, I feel like you're not afraid of anything. And I was like, that's, that's not it. Like, and even we talk about like self-growth a lot and both of those things, like bravery and self-growth is like every day, the, the slate is wiped clean and you have to show up again. And I think that's the thing that everybody misses. It's not like you kind of just make these changes and now this is the new you, this is the new standard and you never have to worry about problems. It's like every day, everybody faces some sort of resistance and overcoming that and building on that is what you stack to become the person. You describe that very, very well where, yeah, it's not just an easy, quick fix. And um, I can tell the uh, uh, clients that come to me that do feel like that because they'll come to a session or two, maybe three, and then I won't hear from them again. And it's just like, do you think that I am going to fix your problem? No, I help identify the problem that you have. We create a mindset um a growth mindset from there. And then I show you the skills that you can do daily. And once again, we can get all the way to showing the skills, but if they don't practice the skills on a regular basis and make it a lifestyle change, then, you know, that's out of my hands. I can't do any, anything else other than be right next to them and be like, do it. <laughs> you have to, do it. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I'm not that person. I am more, I have to give suggestions. I can't make anybody do anything. I'm just here for, um, I guess the moral support and the education just to back up my evidence. Yeah, no, absolutely. And a couple of other things you touched on. So personally, I love the idea of like life coaching. I just don't love the connotation that comes with it. And I think this is so much more aligned and so much more purposeful because I feel like the idea of life coaching is like, you almost like, almost like a puppet master, you're pulling the strings for people to kind of guide them through life. And here you're really just helping people sort out their own answers, because that's all we could do anyway. And, mm -hmm. and like you said, like proof is in the pudding, you did it with yourself. Um, yeah. So I, I want to ask, do you think empowering yourself gave you the tools to empower other people? Or where was like that next step of like, okay, I made these changes, I saw the positive effect this had on me, like, I want to like spread this, like, what was the the turning moment? through all of that kind of both um I think number one was more um empowering myself to be able to empower others because if I don't believe in what I'm practicing that no one else is going to and it's kind of funny that like in the beginning of my practice I definitely could tell like whenever I was trying to tell people what I did or like let them know how um like if I'm selling something you could tell that I wasn't believing myself and they just looked at me like, mm, you know what, this kind of seems like blame or phony or whatever. And the more that I realized that like, I have to believe in myself to be able to show others what I can do. That's when, once again, that buy-in really came in. So empowering myself, because if I'm, you know, once again, not doing any of this type of work, my clients aren't going to believe me when it comes to their own lives. So yeah, I feel like the empowerment, finally getting that full confidence in myself in this realm, it really changed uh, the game for, you know, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And e even when you're saying that, it makes me think of like, like, why would anybody go to an out of shape personal trainer, right? And like, in the same aspect, like, this is obviously a different field, because it's like, no one's going to have the perfect life. So you can't have it all figured out. But you utilizing your own tools and showing people that that's how you're navigating your life, and it's working, 
and you're you're happy and you're progressing it's kind of proof is in the pudding right there yeah yeah I totally agree and you did bring up like the whole life coaching thing too um I definitely can do tools like that some people just need to get their schedules organized and that's that's it other times it's very very serious stuff and that's why I like the certification that I have because it allows me to go into every single realm that you know is going to be beneficial to my clients so yeah it can be as simple as just you know writing down what you're going to do in the morning or we can go deep into different theories and do interventions that you're going to have to practice on your own yeah absolutely and i'm just curious uh because i know that like we kind of touched on like you kind of need someone that's aligned and, and going to buy in as well have you ever had clients come to you where it's just like i i can't work with you like you almost fire clients yes um, some clients come to me whenever it's a little bit more serious. I think that there's still a bit of a stigma of talking to a, like a licensed, um, a professional counselor. It's like basically them giving up. And for whatever reason, when people come to me, it's like, oh, you, you seem to fit the same type of values that I do. And, um, because of that, I can tell that some people come to me with way more serious issues. And I know when I first started out, I actually worked with somebody that had, um, what was it? Um, she was like schizophrenic and bipolar at the same time. And I didn't know what to do, but that was, you know, before I had the full blown education that I had and I was working for somebody else at the time and I felt uncomfortable working with them. But since I worked with it for a different company, they're like, no, 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 just keep working with them. It's going to be fine. And that's when um, things got a little bit more serious with um, that client. And I did have to, like you said, quote unquote fire. And the technical word is refer them to somebody else, you know, like they need to be with somebody that actually specializes in that area and like same simple things like if you come to me and you tell me that you're an alcoholic once again that is such a special issue that I shouldn't be working with you we can still communicate together and we can maintain your symptoms but I need to refer you to somebody else to make sure you can manage those symptoms um, either medically or through different interventions and then we can also work on performance but yeah some people have to work with two different um, um, I don't want to call them doctors because I'm not a doctor but um, I guess counseling consultant whatever you want to call it <laughs> no absolutely and and kind of to switch gears a little bit i saw your posts i think it was your most recent post we kind of talked about this briefly um and you kind of said how you found your voice you touched on it earlier as well but you kind of said how you found your voice through fitness if you kind of want to like walk through like what that means to you and like how that's helped you so you know, growing up, I just felt like physical activity. I, my mom said that I basically was running since the moment I could like crawl. And I think I've just had a lot of like built up energy growing up. And uh, same thing. I remember just being young and one of the biggest blocks was my, um, my speech. And when I wanted to have, if my, you know, like I remember being young and this kid, I mean, not my kid, my mom, she asked me if I wanted something and I couldn't finish the sentence. So all I did was point. And after pointing it, it, like I realized like I couldn't finish my sentences at all. And that's where that overcoming of adversity for me really um, started to become challenging. Um, I'm sorry, I forget the question. Can you repeat it? I feel like I went on a different rabbit hole. No, no problem. I was just saying like, how, how has like fitness and like athleticism kind of really helped you find your voice? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I knew I was going somewhere with that. Um, so I noticed it was actually easier to just kind of keep my mouth shut and show people that I was worthy through my physical activity. Anytime that I do something, everybody's like, wow, you should be a cyclist. You, you should be a volleyball player. You should do lacrosse. And I think fitness just naturally has always been an easy thing for me. Um, one of like something just recent, my husband took me uh, clay shooting one time 
And I remember him and his buddy were like, it's okay, you'll get them, you'll eventually get them. And that wasn't even a thought that crossed my mind that this sport was hard. I just knew that I was new to it and learning. I gave myself the self-compassion of being a learner. But when it came to, you know, being able to say sentences properly and having full-blown conversations with people, I felt like I, I shouldn't be a learner anymore. You know, like I should have learned that years ago, like being, you know, 16, 17 and still not being able to talk the best way that I want to felt like I already lost my um, opportunity to be able to get to that level. So I think that's why physical activity was always it for me, because like I didn't have to talk. I was just able to show people that I was valuable in that way. And then it made me realize that, you know, I can't keep hiding behind this persona all the time. And I recently heard a podcast actually, and somebody did the same exact thing. And I started crying because I'm like, wow, I, I didn't realize how impactful that was to me. And then hearing somebody else's story about how they always hid behind their athletic career, it really hit home. And now they talk about having a podcast and it's cool that they talk about how they work on their insecurities every single day. And it's like, once again, like, why are we running from those insecurities their insecurities because we don't believe that we can do that. If you work towards it, the insecurity is going to go away. But that's the difference between somebody that wants to get out of their comfort zone or stay in the comfort zone. And I knew that if I wanted to level up where I wanted to be, I had to get out of that comfort. Yeah. So I completely align with that. Like I was not a good student. I always kind of put the connotation on myself of like, I'm just dumb and, and, all of that. And then you're right. Like when it came to the physical stuff, it was like, Oh, I can do this. That's it. Like, I just have to run or I just have to like play baseball or or play football. Like this is, this stuff is easy. The physical stuff is easy. Like I'll combat that adversary and the kind of, you know, how uncomfortable that stuff could be is because like, at least I don't have to use my mind is how I used to look at it. Um, and even to this day, like I, I was a kid that used to like, you know, you go around the room, um in class and you're getting asked to read and i'm the one counting how many people are in front of me and then when i could go to the bathroom like or getting out of presentation yeah. um and it, it's just funny because now like like that's why i did this because i hate this like i actually now i've grown to like it because i've just made myself so uncomfortable at this point that it's just a part of me same with all of my right. social media it's like it's just but i found that the same way like I recently just ran a hundred miles and like, that's why I do that to let it trickle into other areas of my life. It's not about running a hundred miles. Of course I enjoy running like, but it's also because I just know forcing myself into that makes me better overall. And like you said, it kind of just like unlocks those doors of like, well, what else can I do? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, I think uh, when I first started doing all those Spartan races, I realized like, the course itself, I don't want to really say the obstacles were challenging, but the course itself, man, I, it's taken me through some crazy, crazy things. And um, I noticed like, I'm like, okay, I, I get cold really, really easily. How do I get better than that? I'm fully submerging myself in ice baths. I go look outside and see the most miserable weather. I'm like, I guess I'm going to go for a run. I noticed that doing harder stuff may be fish for trying to be able to adapt to it. And that's one of the things I think is so challenging for people. Like we talked about that sl uh, slump, people aren't able to adapt to their new environment. And they kind of just sit in this, like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do from here. And it, once again, it's easier to just run away from it than trying to um, handle it head on. So the more that you put yourself through that hard challenging thing like you said it's gonna it's gonna be fun like i like running in cold weather now i notice i actually run better in cold weather compared to summertime now and now that's something like well now i have to work on my heat uh, temperature make sure that i figure out tools on how to keep myself cool whenever it's like a desert race or something like that but yeah i, I really enjoyed just being able to get out of my comfort zone and like um we were gonna we are going to touch base a little bit on like the whole RV life too. I feel like that's where it started out with 
um, being able to do hard, challenging things. Because growing up, I lived in Pennsylvania, and then I went to school in Ohio. And to me, that was getting out because Pencil, um, at least the school that I went to, it was called the bubble. And I'm sure almost every high school kind of says that, but I felt like the bubble, I wasn't able to pop it. Now that I'm RVing, I feel like anything is possible. I go with the flow. Um, a squirrel one time got in her RV and my husband was so mad. I was like, you know what? I'm just happy to be alive. Like there's way worse things that could happen because like I'm wasting my time doing random things like that compared to every single day having to cut grass and having to clean a whole entire house and man uh, managing certain things that I know personally I don't care about, but the society of having a social norm kind of home of how the picket fence and having you know your little suburb town that's the image that I started off doing I'm like I don't care about any of this why am I doing all these things that you know like I feel like just once again society was putting me into and now that I live in an RV and I can live out west for a little bit I can go to New England uh, we we spent a lot of time in Florida during the winter which we're going to be going to Florida in the uh, next couple weeks. Um, but anyways, like I think that um, adversity of living in something that's quote unquote not normal, now it's like so simple. Like honestly, when I go into houses, I feel like I am so like tiny in this massive thing. And um, yeah, it's just an adjustment. And that adjustment of just once again, whatever is available to me at this time is what I can use. So like a lot of people ask me too, how my training is. And like, I just have to make it work with what I have. So you saw my pull-up bar that's right next to me. Like I, I have that, that I can bring anywhere. We always try to find RV parks that are close to gym. So if we want to get some lifting and we can go there, we um, like to try to find trails or mountain biking places or a place to swim. Anything is possible if you just, make it work for you know the the stuff or the environment that you have around you yeah absolutely i think i think there's also such freedom to like simplicity right where like there's less to manage there's less to worry about and and how you kind of combat that is like how everybody should kind of navigate their own life is like define success to yourself like is success a million dollar home is success an rv is success your own company is success you know what i mean like everybody like you said there's so many societal pressures to follow and conform to normal even though normal could be whatever you want normal to be. And I think right. we all forget that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I ask my clients a lot, like what their definition of success is. And you can tell that they're trying to figure out what the actual definition of success is in the dictionary. I'm like, no, no, no. What is your definition? And um, that's one of the things like you also like, um, we were going to talk about how being physically fit. Does that mean that you're successful? And I mean, the short answer I would say is yes, but the long answer is I think people that, that are physically fit, they just basically um, do actions daily that make them successful. And you kind of touched it here as well, where it's like success could mean that you have a law firm down in New York City, or you spend, success also could mean spending as much time outside and being able to survive on the land. Those two successful people, one in a suit, one probably looking like a dirt bag, they are both probably happy with their ability to, you know, give their full potential in those two areas. But when it comes to a successful person, I feel like just being able to get up early, eat, you know, a regular healthy diet, going to doctor checkups, trying to get out of your comfort zone. I think that's how we become more successful. Yeah. So you're basically saying there's always more to learn. And I totally agree. Cause I think, I think life really like the older I get, the more I realize like it's, it's just asking yourself the questions and then answering your own questions. Cause we get too caught up in everyone else's questions or like the societal questions or the societal norms of like what we have to do. And like, nobody has to do anything realistically. Um, and that's what I think life is. It's, it's really just answering your own questions and like actually making sure you're the one asking yourself those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I think too, people don't realize that most of these quote unquote roles and social norms that we had were people that, you know, back in the day, they just had money and power to be able to make that role. And it's funny if you look at 
why, like, while I was traveling, I was really curious about, like, how the states got their shapes, and I learned so much um, because of that, and the ultimate reason is literally money and power, and this is what people said was the normal thing to do, and is it, I, I mean, yeah, we're all following the same rule, but what's right versus right, what's wrong, other than if you're not hurting anybody else, you're allowed to do whatever you want. And I think with the pandemic occurring, that's a lot of people realize they're doing a lot of things that they were only doing because it was the social norm. Like nowadays, people don't want to go into work. They kind of want to work for themselves. And I understand the stigma of like, you know, TikTok and stuff and how that can look um, bad for people that don't live like that. But yeah, they get to follow their own rules. They, they're their own boss. They get to make money the way that works best for them. And I think that's awesome for people that, you know, are um, stay at home moms or maybe were unsure of what to do. And then they found this outlet of being able to be themselves through, you know, technology. I do see it really, um, really cool in that spectrum. Is that the lifestyle that I want to live? Not really. Like it's cool to make videos here and there, but I feel like there's just so much um, other things that would probably work best for me in um, that spectrum. Yeah, I totally agree. And and something that I've dealt with, I sometimes deal with, and I think it's something that I'm always kind of like constantly learning is, and I'm I'm curious if you came across it or if you deal with any clients that come across it, but it's like almost becoming consumed with your fitness and with your athletic endeavors. And then that almost taking over who you are, because then you fall on the other end of it, where it's like, if you get an injury and now it's like, you don't know who you are, you lose identity almost. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I, I never really got to touch base. I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of through the mental block of um, basically how I felt like I was a dumb athlete. Uh, I think this also kind of started occurring because I did go through a lot of my own injuries myself. Um, I feel like everybody kind of tears their ACL. So I, of course, you know, jumped on that bandwagon as well. But the two things that really were challenging for me, um, I ended up having back spasms when I was in like seventh and eighth grade. And I ended up having back surgery uh, when I was 19 because my discs in my L3, 4, and 5 um, became herniated and bulging. And um, I also found out that I have Crohn's disease. And that's another reason why most of my lifestyle changes have changed into this spectrum, just because I realized that, you know, I hurt sitting or I hurt doing an hour of exercise. It's not about physically what are my body's going to be, but after the mental clarity of just feeling so much better with who I am. Um, so when it comes to that, like adversity of having that injury or anything else, I, I think that um, that can definitely change people's perspectives on how to um, tackle their daily life. Um, so can you repeat that question one more time so I can finish my my thought that I had? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, do you ever deal with people becoming like almost too consumed? And then if they do get injured, you kind of lose your identity or even you could just lose your identity by being all consumed by fitness and whatever endeavor that is for, for the individual. Yeah. So I think when it comes to the hybrid world, it's very easy to not, not feel like you identify as one thing just because you have to be mediocre at a lot of things. You know, you, you have to be able to mountain bike, you have to be able to lift heavy, you have to be able to run hard and fast, you have to be able to run a hundred miles. I think it's easy as a hybrid athlete to not get stuck into a specific identity. Now, some people that do specialize, you know, like um, some people that just run 400 meter sprints, like most of their training is running a little bit more than 400 meter sprints, but it's all about quickness and um, being able to outbeat people on a track. And I feel like that when it comes to always doing the same thing over and over again, I think that's where the identity crisis can occur because they're so focused on one thing that they're not able to see all the other elements out and around them. Um, but that's why I give credit with the hybrid athlete because yeah, it's like, great, I have to be really good at this today, but next week I have to be really good at this. So it kind of keeps it fresh and um, it, it's consistent, but it's inconsistent, if you know what I mean. You're consistently changing it up. So you're used to having that unknown factor. And then we kind of talked about the injury 
where I started off, where it's like you lose your identity because you're not doing that action that you typically do. Um, this is where I feel like there's so many other ways that you can get improved without always doing, quote unquote, the physical activity. So that's why, you know, when somebody's injured, it's easy for them to start talking about um, doing that mental training because it's something that they're able to do whenever they are injured. But even if they are injured, what are certain things that we can do with their body whenever, um, you know, let's just say our upper arms are, you know, we have to get rotator cuff surgery. What can we do to the lower extremities to get stronger, more powerful during that time? And I think when people are injured, it's really easy to just listen to the doctor and be like, okay, you have to rest for X amount of time. What they mean by rest, they just mean rest from your sport. They don't mean rest from everything else. And I think that's where um, most people fail to realize that I can still get better and improve during this time. Yeah, it's so true. And and you hit on it exactly. And it's like a new way that I just kind of framed it as you were talking there. And it's almost like, you know, it it's almost people telling you to slow down, right? Where like, it's like you hear from a doctor and like, I've heard it from friends. It's like, well, you can't just run a hundred miles. Like you'll, you're all consumed. And then it's like, what happens when you get hurt? And like, I proved that after my hundred mile race, I had like two weeks. I really needed to like, kind of like slow down. And I just started biking like a madman. Like I biked a hundred miles and like, it's like it movement is medicine to me. So like, even if I have to walk a hundred miles, like this is what I enjoy doing. Um, and again, it goes back to like, having your own answers, but yeah, it's so true because it's not the running. It's not the biking. It's not the lifting. It's the mental clarity is why, most people do these things to the extreme that we do them. Like we're, we're answering questions that have nothing to do with fitness. Right. Yeah. And, um, I, I think too, when it comes to athletics, we're always trying to find that, you know, the runner's high, that high peak level feeling our best. And I think sometimes that, um, athletes are very similar to addicts where the first time they ever get that massive high, they're always looking for it again. So every single day they're trying to figure out how to get that feeling again. And I think that's where sometimes athletes, they realize like, okay, we, you can have that feeling and you can get that feeling again, but in a different you know, perspective and a different uh, source of uh, physical activity. Once again, it's the way how you view it, because like same with the addict, they're just viewing that they're never high enough. And when it comes to an athlete, it's never, they're never fit enough. They're never strong enough, whatever that case is. When you come to that satisfaction of, you know, what everything I'm doing is making me who I like, who I want to be, I think that's where people forget about the process because like once you get to a certain level, you're always trying to, you know, get better and better at something that, yeah, it's, it starts to become kind of blinding and very narrow vision where you can't see all the other elements that are making you, you know, improved at that time. So I think it's an interesting way to look at both as like athletes or like addicts, how do we get that runner's high, but also get that satisfaction during the process of, you know, just, you know, training. Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like it comes down to like what you're chasing for sure. And, and lastly, I ask everybody, what keeps you going? Like, what's your why? My why, um, I think when I did go through all those injuries, it's funny, I didn't really realize what was going on until out of nowhere, like my teammates, I felt like I wasn't part of the team anymore. I, I wasn't able to like train or practice. So I had my teammates be like, oh, I forgot my water down in my locker room. Can you grab it for me? Ooh, this is, um, you know, I forgot to do this. Can you do that for me? I'm like, I'm here at practice. I, I feel like I'm, I wasn't part of the team anymore. And I could tell that like, I was starting to get depressed feelings because of how everybody else was viewing me. So like, basically what keeps me going is just making sure people feel like they are valued during their difficult times. Because if you don't get that empathy from other people and you don't have that social support, and then it's it's really challenging just to think you can do it all on your own. Uh, as humans, we are always trying to find connections. That's why people, you know, get married and go into relationships. They like to have a partner in crime to do those things with them. And whenever you're having a hard time, let's just say you're only at 20%, you're 
your significant other can give you that 80% that you need to make it a full 100. So just being able to give people that social support that, you know, that they're going uh, the extra mile, because like, that's what I needed whenever I was younger. I think, you know, it just, I, I think having that like mind feeling is what really, uh, you know, as you said, keeps me going. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. And I think when you could kind of now mentor from the place that you came from, I like, I feel like that's how people find alignment. Like, I just think often that's where it comes from. And I, I feel the same way. And I really, really appreciate the time. Yeah, I appreciate the time as well. And um, thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you. Thank you.